Now, here's where this all started. Last week, somebody came to me and they asked me this question. And uh, I actually got back to the hotel and I wrote it down. And uh, to the best of my memory, can those who have had an opportunity to be saved before the rapture, but rejected it, be saved after the rapture and during the great tribulation? Now, if you've listened to me teach for any length of time, uh, you know that the chronology of Bible prophecy, the next major prophetic event in the Bible, is an event coming up called the rapture of the church. And then after the rapture of the church, an event called the great tribulation, a seven-year span of time where the wrath of God is going to judge this earth. After the great tribulation, the second coming of Christ, after the second coming of Christ, the millennial reign, and then we enter into eternity. And uh, I'm not going to take the time to teach that chronology, but to tell you that the next major event is the rapture of the church. The great tribulation is after that. Now, if you have questions on that, uh, I'm almost certain that we have uh, podcasts on five reasons why the church cannot go through the great tribulation. So rather than taking time to explain that to you here, let me challenge you to go back to one of our archived broadcasts on this channel or to go to our podcast channel and search for five reasons why the church cannot go through the great tribulation. Now, the reason why I think a lot of people ask this question, and I'm very open with you, uh, not all scholars believe the exact same thing when it comes to the interpretation of Bible prophecy. But if you follow me, one of the things that you're also aware of is that I don't give you my commentary. Uh, when we touch this subject, I'm going to walk you straight through the Bible. How many times have you heard me say, start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, finish in the Bible, and on this subject, we're headed there right now. But that question that was asked, if someone has had an opportunity to be saved before the rapture, and then they miss the rapture, can they be saved during the Great Tribulation? We're going to take a look at that. Because many people who have watched uh, some of the original end-time movies from the 70s, and uh, some of you are old enough that you've seen those movies, Left Behind, and you've read some of Tim LaHaye's books, Left Behind, and the series that came out on that, and Hollywood made a movie called Left Behind, and there are novels at the Christian bookstore on Left Behind, The Great Tribulation, The Rapture, and uh, a lot of people have listened. Uh, can I give you a word of, of, of counsel? Don't build your doctrine on Hollywood movies. And don't build your doctrine on novels at Christian bookstores. Build your doctrine and your belief systems upon what the Bible said. I'm going to take that one step further and this will offend some of you. Don't build your doctrine upon the denominational creed of your particular flavor of the month. Now, I don't criticize denominations, you know. Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, Presbyterian, on and on and on. But I'm just honest enough to tell you that in heaven there won't be any cliques and clubs. In heaven there won't be any denominations. The Bible tells me in Bible prophecy there are only two words that you need to focus on to be ready. And it's found multiple times in various passages on being ready for the rapture, the great tribulation, the millennial reign, eternity, salvation, etc., and those two words are in Christ. If you're taking notes, write that down. That is the only thing that prepares a man or a woman or a teenager or a boy or a girl to be ready to meet the Lord. There has to be a time in your life when you repent of sin, acknowledge God, believe in Christ, and salvation is available only in Christ, Christ alone. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So in Christ. 
So I'm not criticizing your denomination. I've just been an evangelist for 40 years and a lot of people are devoted more to their denomination than they are to the truth of the Bible, and that's wrong. Your number one devotion and consecration should be to the Bible, God's holy word. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Here it is, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you have your Bible. I'll give you just a moment to get there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's in the New Testament. Go down to verse 9. Again, the question, if you miss the rapture, but you've had an opportunity to be saved before the rapture, can you come back to God during the great tribulation? And uh, I'll just give you the straight answer up front. No. No, you cannot. According to my understanding of Scripture, and I'm going to walk you through it, the rest of this program is just going to be straight Bible passages and uh, exegesis and explanation. We're just going to go right through the Scriptures now, I, I told you before, I'm going to tell you again, there are some scholars that have varying opinions on this. As you might understand, uh, there are conservative scholars and there are liberal scholars and there are scholars all the way in between. And so obviously, scholars have various opinions on verses in the Bible, but I'm just old-fashioned enough to believe that when God wrote the Bible, first of all, He used a lot of regular people. Paul was uh, perhaps the greatest scholar alive in his era as far as actual, uh, the way he was raised, the cultures that he was exposed to, the education that he had, the religious education that he had, the experience and being uh, involved in all kinds of uh, uh, law and religion and education. Paul was the most uh, and that's not my opinion. Most scholars agree. Paul was probably the most intellectual, scholared author of all uh, of the Bible books by man's qualifications. But again, you have to remember that the Bible was written as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. So I don't know how much credit you can give to a book, to the pen that was used by the author to write the book because all of the credit for the book goes to the author, not the pen. And so the men and women that were used in the Bible to write down these sacred things, a compilation of 66 books that we call the Bible, I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think it's really wise uh, to start debating uh, the quality of the pen when we know that the author of the Bible is God. But the point is made that when God gave us these 66 books, he didn't exclusively go to the highest uh, education available at that time. He used a lot of real people, a lot of grassroots individuals, and uh, I want you to see this. 2 Peter chapter 2, by the way, Paul wrote this, verse 9, the Bible said, this man, now this speaks of the Antichrist, I don't have time to go all the way through First and Second Thessalonians, uh, but uh, when the Bible says this man, if you read all of this in context, you'll clearly see that it's referring to the Antichrist. So this man, the Antichrist, will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. Pause right there. Uh, I personally believe the Antichrist is alive today. I base that upon a passage that Jesus taught us in Matthew in the 24th chapter. Uh, the Bible uh, speaks, uh, when you see this generation that witnesses the rebirth of Israel, uh, the Bible teaches the generation that witnesses the rebirth of Israel will not pass until all of these things are fulfilled. Uh, even last night when I got in, and uh, I got my four bags and went out on the curb and got a taxi. And when I got into uh, the taxi, uh, the man's name was Peter, and uh, he remembered me. And uh, he said, where, where are you returning from? And I said, Texas. 
And uh, I said, I've had you before, haven't I? He said, three times. And uh, he said, are you still teaching on prophecy? And I said, I am. Well, I didn't remember it, but I guess the first time that he picked me up in the 13 minutes it took to get from the airport to my house, God had opened uh, an opportunity. And so again, as soon as he brought that up, uh, I began to go through many of the prophecies that are unfolding in recent days. And he was asking me what I thought about this virus in China. And he was asking me what I thought about all of these uh, volcanoes all over the world who all of a sudden are spewing ash miles into the air. And he had questions. And, and then what really brought the light to my heart was he said, uh, you know, since you uh, spoke to me that first time about some of these things, he said, uh, I, I have a Bible. And he said, I've been reading it. And the Bible said, and he he referred a passage to me. So it lets me know that he's studying the Bible. And of course, in 13 minutes, it's kind of hard to, um, I hate to use the phrase, close the deal, but uh, I'm always looking for that opportunity to pray a sinner's prayer with somebody when I sense that the Holy Spirit's in that. But uh, he was talking and you need, when people talk, you need to listen. But when we got to the house, I, I said to him before I left, I said, well, just remember the most important thing is when you lay your head to the pillow tonight, you need to be ready to meet the Lord. I'm glad you're reading your Bible. I'm glad you're studying these things. But there has to be a time in your life, Peter, when you just pray a simple prayer. Just tell the Lord that you're a sinner and ask Him to forgive you. Tell Him you trust in Jesus. I said, if you haven't read it, go home and read John chapter 3, verse 16. Know that that's for you. And you need to be ready to meet the Lord. And uh, shook his hand, gave him his fare and a generous tip and, you know, made the best of that opportunity. But a lot of people, they get their doctrine from novels and movies and liberal theologians and the History Channel and Discovery Channel. And, and no wonder there's so much confusion. But some of these very famous movies on prophecy that were made by Christians and distributed by evangelistic organizations, they showed that people who had not been ready to meet the Lord, they were Christians prior to the rapture, backslidden when the rapture took place, left behind, left behind, and then uh, they had to make that choice, either receive the mark of the beast, Revelation chapter 13, the Bible says the Antichrist will force the entirety of the world to submit to a global e-commerce uh, called the mark of the beast. And they'll receive that mark on their forehead or on the back of their right hand. Uh, on my Twitter account I saw this morning, uh, I preached on the mark of the beast in Texas. And uh, some lady either watched it online. I don't think they'd have been in that church because... Uh, I don't think the church would have taught nor tolerated this type of foolishness, but uh, they actually sent a picture of people wearing Make America Great Again hats. And uh, I'll not say what the tweet was because I don't want to identify the person, but uh, they obviously were inferring that everybody that's wearing, uh, you know, the red Make America Great Again hat, uh, well, there it is. It's a mark of the beast. They're wearing a a hat that touches their forehead and they probably have to use their right hand to put it on. And, and uh, you know, people are literally... I'll let it what I was going to say. That's foolish. And uh, first of all, the Antichrist is not coming to make America great again. <laughs> you know, bing, light number one. Um, the Bible says that when the Antichrist is revealed, that he will force every nation on the planet to be subservient to him. And the mark of the beast is not going to be a ball cap. And uh, the mark of the beast is not going to be for America. And the Antichrist is not coming to the earth to make America great again. Now, I don't know. I don't know whether they were trying to uh, say, hey, you know, maybe everybody that's wearing this hat, they've got the mark of the beast and they don't know it. Or, you know, maybe they think that uh, President Donald Trump is the Antichrist. I think that's what they were actually inferring. Uh, I can guarantee you that Donald Trump is not the Antichrist. So how can you guarantee that from the Bible? 
of course. Daniel chapter 11 verse 37 tells us that the Antichrist is either going to be a homosexual or androgynous. And uh, the Bible says that he'll have no desire nor regard for women. And there's only two uh, answers to that from scholarship throughout the ages. And one is that he'll be homosexual. The other is that uh, he'd be androgynous. Well, I can, I can pretty well assure you that Donald Trump's not a homosexual. I don't think that's been his problem through the years. And um, it's like years ago when Bill Clinton was president, a lot of people were trying to preach and teach that uh, he was the Antichrist. And uh, I said, I don't know if you followed his sexual patterns through the years, but I can pretty well promise you uh, he's not androgynous nor homosexual. But uh, people get into the most foolish views on Bible prophecy, and sadly many preachers and many books and many movies do the same. So, first of all, I want you to see the first part of this verse, that the Antichrist is actually going to be possessed and puppeted by Satan. And the Bible says that he will have this incredible counterfeiting power. The Antichrist is going to be a supernatural counterfeiter with signs and power and miracles. Just one example, you know, just as the Bible gives us the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, uh, there is an unholy trinity in the Great Tribulation. And that unholy trinity is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Even the mark of the beast is a counterfeit. When he uses a mark, whether it's subdermal technology or RFID chips or barcodes or uh, e-commerce tattoos, I mean, there's all kinds of technologies that have been available for many years. Uh, some of you saw just last week that Amazon, pay attention, Amazon just announced that they've developed a new technology of global finance that will utilize the hand. And uh, they've promised that they're going to announce that soon. And the uh, gist of this technology that Amazon is going to announce is your hand will become uh, your credit card. It'll become your iCloud. It'll become your uh, source of data. It'll become your source of security. And Amazon is announcing that uh, they have created a system that they'll soon announce and make available to all Prime uh, members, I think, for free, from what I read in, in some of the research. But, uh, you know, the technology exists for this, which to me, again, is another amazing proof of Bible prophecy, that in the first century, John, who was the author of the book of Revelation, think of this, in the first century, John prophesied a global e-commerce, one world, currency. I mean, that's off the charts when it comes to just, you know, creative thinking, but impossible. It's only been in recent years that the technology has been available to fulfill that one world currency, the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. It's only been in recent years that that's been available. But John prophesied that. That should help some of you that wonder, you know, well, can I really believe the Bible? Bible prophecy should nail your doubts to the floor. It's never lied, never will. Let's read on. This man, the Antichrist, will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power, signs, and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception. Now, circle or highlight that word deception because this is the number one core value of what the Antichrist politically, spiritually, prophetically will be. He will embody the most powerful, wicked deception in human history. Just as Jesus Christ embodied the most powerful, supernatural, self-evident truth of God that leads people to heaven, the Antichrist will be the antithesis of that. He will embody the most supernatural, powerful, evil deception of truth that leads people eternally to hell and to damnation. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those, pause again, 
I'm breaking this down very slowly, piece by piece. He's going to, during the great tribulation, he's going to use part of that great supernatural deception is going to be specifically targeted at a group of people. Well, where do you find that, Tiff? He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those. Fool those. Those two words let me know that there are a group of people who are going to be targeted with this satanic deception. Let's read on. To fool those who are on their way to destruction. Pause again. This group of people, those targeted by the evil deception, fooled those. The Bible tells us they're on their way to destruction. Their fate has already been sealed. The highway that they're traveling is already locked into their eternal GPS. The course is set and it's irreversible. They are on their way to destruction. There is no possibility of a Y in the road. There is no possibility here in the Greek of a U-turn. They have been fooled by the great deception of the Antichrist. And as a result of that deception, they are on their way to destruction. Because, well, that word denotes a reason. Because, here it is, they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So it, it broadens out the definition. This group of people targeted by this supernatural deception of the Antichrist, this specific group, this group that's on their way to destruction, here's the reason why. They refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. Well, what is salvation? What saves us? Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, no other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. The only way to be saved, the only way to have a right relationship with God is through the repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. The Bible said in Romans, All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, the Bible is filled with verses that are like signs on a highway pointing to the final exit, that if you want to have right relationship with God, there's no other way but to receive the truth of the gospel, the life, the death, the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul very carefully told us what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15. And the entirety of Paul's definition of the gospel is the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the only way that your sins can be forgiven and you can have right relationship with God. You have to come in childlike faith to Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you're uncertain as to where you stand spiritually with God the Father, we're going to pray in just a few moments. And I want you to stay tuned. Let's go back to this. They refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. That word refuse in the Greek text I mean, this, this, you don't need to be a Greek scholar. You don't need to understand Hebrew and Aramaic. You don't need to be a graduate of, of a seminary. I'm just simply unfolding this piece by piece because I want you to see there's, there's really no, there's no way of, well, this could possibly mean. No, I don't see that here. That word refuse in the Greek is past tense. I mean, let's make it more simple. You can't refuse something until it's been offered to you. The very word refuse translated from the Greek to our English language meant the same in the original text. Before you can refuse something, someone has to offer you something. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. 
gift. Well, what's a gift? It's something that someone who loves you, respects you, honors you. It's something that they give to you that they bought and paid for in full. You played no part in it. A real gift, the only thing that pre, uh, predates your receiving a gift is an understanding is that that was something that was given by a person that loved. Now I either have to receive it or to reject it. They refused. So that lets me know, well, what did they refuse? They refused the truth that would save them. What's the truth that saves? We've already covered that with multiple verses. The only way you can be saved is through Christ. So here is a group of people. The Antichrist is revealed. So we know this refers to a group of people after the rapture. Because the Antichrist, the Bible says, cannot be revealed until the power that restrains him is taken out of the way. That's taught in the scripture. Don't have time today to get into all of the restraining teaching. But the Bible teaches me that the spirit-filled church, not the fake church, not the apostate church, not all of the churches in the world, but the true bride of Christ, the holy church, the redeemed church, the church that's without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, that's living ready to meet the Lord, the true church, those who belong to Christ. The church age, by the way, if you're a new student of the Bible, the church age began with Christ, and the church age ends at the rapture. That's the only segment in time that's referred to as the church age. And Christ is coming for all who have received Him during the church age, the true church. So the Antichrist is already revealed what, what's removed? What's the restraining power that has to be removed in Thessalonians before the Antichrist can be revealed? Now, some would argue it's the Holy Spirit. Well, the problem with that view is that the Holy Spirit is a part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And when you go down the attributes of the Trinity, one of the main attributes of the Trinity is omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is present everywhere. And since people are going to be saved during the Great Tribulation, and the Holy Spirit is the agent of salvation, the Holy Spirit's not totally removed from the earth. It's the Spirit-filled church that is removed. So if you want to, uh, and there are times to be technical, there are times to be detailed. The restraining power that will be removed before the Antichrist will be revealed will be the true Spirit-filled church church. That's what's going to be raptured. Those that are in Christ. Remember those words I mentioned earlier, in Christ? The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The rapture of the church is the Spirit-filled, redeemed, ready, holy, pure church. Then the Antichrist is revealed. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 say, say that when the Antichrist comes, after the rapture, after the removal of the Spirit-filled church, when the Antichrist comes, he'll do the work of Satan with counterfeit power signs and miracles. He'll use evil deception to fool those, a specific group of people, who are on their way to destruction, their fates already sealed, why? Because they refused the truth that would save them. So I, I just don't see. Now, I hope you that know me well enough know that when it comes to things in the Scripture that are not absolutely clear, not absolutely definitive, I don't draw a, a clear definitive line based upon my bias. I may have a view but if you've listened to me at all, you've heard me say many times, I want you to know that some scholars have various positions. I mentioned it today. There are conservative scholars. There are liberal scholars. And I'm always honest enough to tell you. But when I present a verse or a passage or a teaching to you, and the Bible does not leave a plan B or a possible plan B, or perhaps a view or a bias that would exegete that scripture in a different way, I can't do that to you. 
I'm, I'm telling you, that's why I, I said today, to me, this is the most terrifying passage in Bible prophecy. Because if you have ever heard the gospel in a way, and I'm not just talking about sitting in church and growing up in church. It's one thing to hear with your natural ears. It's another thing to hear with your spiritual ears. I believe there are people who have been driving down the road, maybe an 18-wheeler, someone going to work, etc., and a Christian station was on the radio or something came on, and they heard the gospel briefly, but they weren't listening spiritually. I believe this speaks of people who have had a time in their life when the gospel was presented under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and they were spoken to by God and the conviction and compassion of the Holy Spirit. That's why I say in our Lost Lamb events, almost everywhere I go, I said it in Texas. One of the problems with listening to Tiff Shuttlesworth is that you will never be able to stand before God in eternity's morning and say, no preacher ever loved me enough to open up the Bible and clearly explain the gospel of salvation to me. No preacher ever loved me enough to say, I'll pray with you. No preacher ever loved me enough to explain that I had to admit my sin and believe in Christ and repent and make a commitment by faith. Because when I pray and go into a service, that's one of the things that I pray about every single time, almost without fail. Lord, help me tonight. Don't let one person who hears me ever be able to stand before God and say no one ever presented the gospel and gave them a chance. So when you listen to me, you're going to stand before God without excuse. That's one of the problems if you listen to me. If you want to listen to someone who's not serious and the ministry's a joke and they laugh more than they cry when it comes to eternal truth, have your way. There's plenty of them out there. There's more out there doing that that love you enough that preach this truth to you. But if you're going to follow me, I have a responsibility to open the Bible and to tell you the truth. And the truth is, 2 Thessalonians 2 shows me that if you've had an opportunity to be saved and the rapture takes place, you're going to hell. It's terrible to say that, but I'm throwing a grenade out there because I want you to wake up. There is no way for you to be saved after the rapture. What if I'm beheaded? There will be people who are saved and beheaded that will make it to heaven, but not you. It'll be people who heard the gospel under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and it was revealed to them for the first time by all of the preaching that goes on during the Great Tribulation. God's raised up a multitude of ways to evangelize during the Great Tribulation. I believe the greatest harvest of souls and salvation is going to take place in that seven-year span of time called the Great Tribulation. One of the ways that he's going to preach the gospel is the Bible tells me that he's going to raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists that will preach throughout the globe. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells me that when God raises up those 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, that he'll put a mark on their forehead to protect them. They'll be able. We don't know what that mark is. But the Bible said God originated the mark. The real mark, the genuine mark, the holy mark is going to be put on the foreheads of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. And whatever it is that God seals them with allows them to preach the gospel and no one touches them or harms them. So again, the Antichrist is the greatest counterfeiter that will ever live in the entirety of human history. His mark is a counterfeit of God's mark. Because the mark of the beast will probably not be implemented until three and a half years into the Great Tribulation where he violates the peace treaty with Israel, but that's another teaching. Are you listening to me? Why is this the most terrifying passage in Bible prophecy to me? It's because many people right now are living thinking they're saved. But they go to church on Sunday, but they live like they always live Monday through Saturday, and they think going to church and hanging out with Christians and singing Amazing Grace once a month 
reading a Bible, praying, having some social media ministries that they follow, that it's all cool with God, right? No. You've got to live a holy life. You've got to be consecrated. You need to be a tither. I mean, Matthew 23, 23. I wonder if people who haven't even learned the fundamentals of obedience to Christ are going to be in heaven. I tell you the reason, and I'm not judging anybody, and I'm not going to take an offering. I'm just telling you that Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, you should tithe. When he taught the disciples, the apostles, and all of his followers, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he commended them that they were so committed to tithing that they actually weighed their grain to tithe off of that. And then he said in Matthew 20, 20, 23, 23, you should tithe. We've got Christians that are still debating as to whether God has access to their funds or not. And I only use that as an illustration because if your bank account is not surrendered to God, I doubt your heart surrendered to God. Because the Bible says the treasure that is in your heart will be manifested in your life. We've got a generation of half-hearted Christians that pick and choose the Bible and pick and choose their commandments and pick and choose their standards. And Jesus said the road that leads to heaven is straight and narrow and few there be that find it. I want you to find it. And so if I'm going to err, listen, don't miss this. If I'm going to err in my teaching to you, I'm always going to err on the side of what I know will get you into heaven. I'm never going to err in my preaching and teaching in a gray area or leave you on the side of wondering. If I'm going to make any mistake, I'm going to be careful that I err on the side of knowing that you're going to make it to heaven. I don't hear any amens. It might be because I'm sitting in front of a camera in our ministry studio. But I hope there's some amens out there. If you want to be ready to meet the Lord, you have to obey all of the teachings of Christ. Well, let me close with these two scriptures and then we'll pray. They refused an opportunity. That lets me know that they had an opportunity. But they refused it. Two verses and we pray. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Now, these two scriptures that I'm going to read before we pray, uh, these are not prophecy scriptures, they're pattern scriptures. In other words, I'm going to close with two scriptures that show me a pattern that would actually support what we see in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 9 through 11. Hebrews chapter 6, go down to verse 4. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. So pause again. Here the Bible is addressing a group of people who were once saved. They were once enlightened. They had repented. They had been saved. They were enlightened. It is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven. Now the author of Hebrews is taking it deeper. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven, shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come. Pause right there. The author of Hebrews, by the way, ladies, there are many scholars who believe uh, that a lady wrote uh, the book of Hebrews. I'm not saying uh, that's factual because we really are not able to say factually or certainty, uh, with certainty who wrote the book of Hebrews. But whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, they layered this out with no wiggle room. Those who were enlightened, those who had once repented, those who had shared in the good things of heaven, those who had shared in the Holy Spirit, those who had tasted the Word of God, those who had tasted the power of the age to come, who then turn away from God. This is why the doctrine of eternal security, to me, is a very frightening doctrine. Because I think once people teach that, it opens the natural door. Well, I gave my heart to Jesus in a Baptist revival in 1968, and so, you know, I'm good to go. 
I'll take another shot of bourbon and tell my mistress I'll be over at 6 p.m. to pick her up. I, I just don't think it works that way. The Bible is pretty clear about those who live in sin and drunkards and gossips and homosexuality and adulterers and on and on and on shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There has to be a change when Christ comes to reside. Who then turn away from God. So they once were with God, but turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing Him to the cross once again and holding Him up to public shame. So this passage of Scripture puts another solid rock of foundation under 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. One more. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Just flip over a few pages. Hebrews chapter 10, go down to verse 26. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning, after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume His enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think, listen to this, just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit, who brings God's mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge, I will pay them back. He also said the Lord will judge His own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I hope I have an un... Uh, under-delivered on that title, the most terrifying passage in all of Bible prophecy to me is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because so many multiple thousands of Christians in North America and around the world are living in an uncommitted Christian state, listening to uncommitted Christian pastors who are preaching uncommitted Christian doctrine. And when the Lord comes... They'll not only be left behind, they'll be left behind with no opportunity to return to the Lord. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins to those who have willingly betrayed the sacred gift of salvation. So we need to be very cautious in these last days. Again, 2 Peter 3, Peter said, Knowing these things are going to happen, what pure and holy lives you should be living. Are you living a pure life? Are you living a holy life? This preacher loves you enough to open the Bible, even when it's hard. Hey, I'll be honest with you. I, I feel this in my own heart when I preach it. Though I feel an anointing to preach it and to, del and to deliver it, I feel the weight and the conviction of this in my own life. But that's what the Bible should do. The Bible should motivate us to live ready to meet the Lord. There's no sin worth going to hell over. There's no man worth going to hell over. There's no woman worth going to hell over. There's no drug. There's no alcohol. There's no artificial high worth going to hell over. I had a man and a woman come to me on the last night of my recent outreach, and they had both given their hearts to Christ on Sunday. Uh, they asked to speak to me on the last night, and it was an older man and an, an older woman. And he said, long story short, she had benefits from her husband that had passed away uh, as far as retirement, military pension, various things that provided uh, a very comfortable lifestyle for them. But he said... If we marry, she'll lose all of that, and I don't have the same financial resources. 
And in other words, she had the cruise ship, he had the canoe. He said, what do you think God would have us to do? And they had told me that they had given their hearts to Christ. Someone had invited them on Sunday. They had given their hearts to the Lord Sunday. I said, the Bible's very clear. The Bible tells me that if you're living together outside of the bonds of marriage, that you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. How much money's worth going to hell over? How much benefit and insurance is worth going to hell over? I said, do you love her? He said with tears, I do. I said, then marry her and don't wait for a big ceremony a year later. Contact the pastor here or go to a justice of the peace. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't live one more day in sin till I got married. And I said, don't you dare go home with her tonight and get into the same bed. Say, Tiff, you said they were elderly people. Yeah, they, they were. But I'm telling you, I'm always going to give people biblical instruction on the side of what's right. I'm never going to give you a gray area of, of hoping this works. Well, the grace of God, who can underestimate the grace of God? I'll tell you who can underestimate the grace of God, the Apostle Paul. Because he went down a long litany of sins and said, if you keep living like that, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So this modern grace message that makes you feel comfortable with your sin is going to send thousands upon multiplied thousands of people who thought they were Christians into an eternity without the Lord. That's why that passage is there. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And it goes down through all kinds of religious conduct. But Jesus replied, I never knew you. Because you can't go to church on Sunday and play Christian and live like hell Monday through Saturday and be ready to meet the Lord. And when the rapture takes place for thousands upon thousands of people, their hell is sealed at the sound of the trumpet. In the twinkling of an eye, their eternity is sealed. The sound of the trumpet. Sealed. No way to be saved. No way to return. No hope for the backslidden. They'll come under the deception of the Antichrist. They're on their way to destruction because they refused to learn, to love, and to live the truth that would save them. Wow. Wow. That's probably one of the heaviest broadcasts I've ever done. But if you're listening to me right now and you're not living pure and holy and ready to meet the Lord, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now, right where you're at. You don't know. You still have a question mark in your heart. Or you've been attending one of these modern North American churches that never preaches on hell, never preaches on eternity, never preaches on repentance, never preaches on holiness, never preaches on the purity of the sanctified church. You may as well go to a Norman Vincent Peel seminar. Listen to me. You need to get ready to meet the Lord. And I'll help you right where you're at. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. A lady last week contacted me on social media and said, I've been listening to you for years, but I wanted you to know that last week when I watched your broadcast on Facebook, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I meant it. Pray that God will help me to live for Him. Some of you need to do the same. Pray this prayer with me right now, right where you're at. Pray it out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, I want to be ready to meet the Lord. I admit my sin. I'm willing to repent, to turn my back on sin, turn my heart to Jesus. I ask you today, have mercy on me with the blood Jesus shed. Wash me and make me holy. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Today I do not refuse, but today I make a willful decision. I receive Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I vow this day I will serve Him. In place of my weakness, give me your strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me to live for you. And Lord, I ask not only that you would save me, but help me to be an agent of salvation to all of my family 
Don't let one member of my family be lost in eternity's mourning. Let my life be an example to family and friends and loved ones. And I pray today in Jesus' name, amen.